Every time. Hi, guys. How is it just me or is the camera kind of low? A little bit low. But... I mean, is this because of uh, your little disaster earlier? Might have been. Might have been my doing. Aiden tried to destroy the entire setup, including both his computer, my old computer, the monitor, the camera, the microphone, our two lights, you know. I told him he couldn't have an extra cookie after the show, and he just went nuts. What can I say? The lack of sugar offers makes me self-destructive. Not just self-destructive. Kind of worried about my own safety now. You're like, you am I gonna am I gonna sure... wake up with the fishes tomorrow? No, you're fine. Just stay away from the event horizon, and you'll be fine. The event horizon? Mm -hmm. It's turning into a black hole of what? You what? Know, just where chaos. did that come from? Where 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 did we get an event horizon? What? I've been watching. Uh, I mean, when I've been I watching Interstellar again, it's on repeat in my head. <laughs> in Twenty got hours cornfield chase going at all <laughs> times. <laughs> oh god! Uh, Stay with me, Tars. But that's actually kind of topical. Yeah, because the movie is about Earth dying. It's a good point. And yeah, uh, that's that's what we're talking about today. I saw a couple of people in chat who were like, you know, oh, is this going to be a religious discussion? Or are we talking about the? This is not going to be a weird Bible episode, I promise you guys yeah, that. Yeah, not quite that. Um, it sure might end up being one, uh, <laughs> depending on how Isaiah feels about it. But yeah, Fair. Uh, the, this was something that came up last week. Somebody mentioned it, and I had heard a little bit about the Adam and Eve story. Mm -hmm. uh, this, of course, is not the Genesis account. Well, it's about the Genesis account, but it's not. It's, uh, it's actually not totally true. There is a re translation of genesis in there um, it's a translation all right oh you haven't even heard that part yet i know but just going wait off till we of, get there yeah going off of what was read earlier yeah uh Woo! we were we were shooting the friday video for this earlier um yeah and we're just a couple i have 40 pages of notes for this 41 pages of notes it's gonna be a long one um, gents. yeah friday's video will probably be around an hour long if not longer um to give you the basics of what we're dealing with here, the the story I heard was, hey, Aiden, did you see that they declassified a CIA document about Adam and Eve that mm. mentions, the, like, you know, 11,500 years ago and all that? And I'm like, ah, okay, interesting. Did not expect to find what I found, which is not a CIA document. It is a classified document that was classified by the CIA, but in and of itself was not written by the CIA, by any of the CIA's agents, uh, by anybody who is known to have worked for the CIA. So it's a little misleading to say that it is a, a classified CIA document, which is why the title of this video says the story the CIA censored. Mm. Because what appears to have happened, as the legend goes, is that Chan Thomas released this book in 1965 via Emerson Press. The CIA immediately stopped it from being further printed. Cease and desist order, shut down, national security, stop it. Yep. That's the story. I could not find anything about why it's censored. Yeah, that was going to be my question. I couldn't even find evidence the CIA ever actually censored it, aside from the fact that on the CIA.gov page, it's there. Well, and it they, says declassified, sanitized copy, released 2013. To be fair, if there's no other evidence that they censored it, actually, they did a pretty good job of censoring it. Oh yeah, they did a damn good <laughs> job. But I want to see. Maybe I can. Maybe I can pull it up. Um, Eve, because I realized the one place I didn't look for why it was censored was the CIA's website. Mm. Now, of course, like I don't trust the CIA. Uh, so, so yeah, let's see. Does uh, it make Oh, well, that's not what I wanted. Um, let's, uh, oh boy. Uh, the Adam and Eve story. I just want to see if it's on the CIA's website. Like, hey, yeah, this is why we classified this. Mm -hmm. Um, publication date, January 1st, 1966. There's two of them here interesting proof for elite oh this is the 2019 one is it the same document oh this isn't the exact same one 
there's uh there's some differences here. I wonder is it the same length? Yeah, it is the same length. Because I didn't find this, I only found the other one first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay, it looks like it's probably the same document then. Um, I don't know why there's a separate a separate 2019 version as opposed to just the one. I mean, I would imagine there are some minor changes of certain uh, things. Oh my god, is this the entire text? That is the entire text. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so document type FOIA, okay, maybe this is just the FOIA requested one, and the other one was the sanitized declassified version, mm -hmm. but the thing is, this one doesn't say, I'm, I'm gonna have to read through this tomorrow, um, and figure out if, if there's anything I need to include in the video, mm -hmm. uh, I'll do that early in the morning, but yeah, the point I was trying to make is that there's really no evidence, there's no information about what was censored, what was sanitized is the term they use, yep. so it's hard to know what the point was or even what necessarily was censored, because this could have been that this document was just, it, you know, in a... It, it, I couldn't find evidence of an order to stop printing it. What I was able to find is the fact that if you want to buy it, it's like a thousand bucks per copy, Good because Lord. there's that few copies of it. Got it. So it seems like production was stopped. Now, why was production stopped is, of course, a question. But there's no real uh, there's no real evidence regarding it being censored, aside from the fact that there is a a version of it on the CIA's website that says declassified, sanitized copy, approved for release, uh, such and such date, twenty thirteen. Now, when you do that, yeah, when you're the CIA and you censor something, basically everybody immediately assumes that whatever is in that document they don't want you to see yep probably because it's true now i have read through this entire document i'm not really concerned about it being accurate to anything yeah uh because the premise that mr thomas presents is that every five to ten thousand years the earth's electromagnetic poles switch and during that time the electromagnetic field is weak enough that the uh semi-solid asthenosphere mm -hmm. which is about 60 to 120 miles beneath the surface i uh, becomes more liquid i guess I, I don't know what a liquid that behaves as a solid means but that's what i was able to find about it is like it's a semi-solid I mean... I assume it's like the steel beams. I was going to say kind of like a non-Newtonian fluid, but that's like different. I don't even know what that means. Uh, it's... I know everything that happened in Europe between 500 and 1500 AD, and I know nothing about physics. Um, I mean, hey, you're a special. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's how it works. Uh, yeah, non-Newtonian fluid, just, I don't know, really simple terms when when moderately acted upon it acts like a fluid but when aggressively acted upon it acts more like a solid it's weird like, so like that weird goop stuff exactly. we used to make as kids exactly. where uh, okay like you can dip your hand in it but when you slap it it's like hitting a like piece of concrete i'm guessing i shouldn't dip my hand into the asthenosphere it's probably not going to be great for your health probably not no also why am i 60 miles beneath the crust of the earth so there's a number of questions and problems here all of them probably not great for your health <laughs> somebody in uh in chat said uh ice is a, a non-newtonian or a, a semi -so it, i laugh not not because that's a stupid thing to say but because i've said that oh really in chemistry class in ninth grade i asked if ice was a solid and when asked to explain why i asked this question i said uh i just wasn't sure if it's a solid or a slow moving liquid like get like glass mm -hmm. and my teacher was like It's a stupid question, but it's not a stupid reason to ask the question. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So thanks, Miss Martin. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you quit after our year. I was going to say, what happened to no stupid questions in, you know, high school? Yeah, I, here's the thing. She, uh, she told the other section of our chemistry class that she could have made a lot more money as a chemist. We, we made that woman quit. Not intentionally. 
we just were to, I, mean, I i told my friend ethan i was going to shove a pencil up his butt at one point um oh the week before the final like during a review session i asked what stoichiometry was which for those in the room who don't know um stoichiometry is the mathematical process for doing chemistry <laughs> I knew how to do it. I just didn't remember what it was called. Yeah, fair. I, I I got a solid C in this class all year. On the final for the radioactive decay section, mm -hmm. I got halfway through the problem and wrote, I tried. <laughs> I got a 93 on the final. No way. <laughs> That's actually impressive. Well done. No, I, I tell that I love this because every time I am tested on science, for some sort of like at a time when it's consequential i do well yeah all other times it's just a blank slate i sat here reading this and i'm like i have no idea how electromagnetism works or the poles or any of this i also have to look up like the, the different layers of the earth because i don't remember them i got a 35 on the act science section yep out of 36 <laughs> <laughs> it just goes to show that testing and knowledge are two different things. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to science. Uh, the good news is, apparently neither did Chan Thomas, despite having degrees from Dartmouth, Columbia, and Harvard. That's concerning. He was apparently a very good electrical engineer. Got it. And we, we know anything about him, because here's the thing, without this book, like it, th this book is inconsequential to why people know about Chan Thomas. At the time, nobody knew who he was. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, like a, a UFO researcher working for a UFO researcher working for a UFO researcher working for McDonnell Douglas working for the U.S. Air Force. Mm. Um, he was hired a year after putting this out mm -hmm. by Dr. Robert M. Wood, who is one of the foremost UFO researchers of the 60s. Uh, who has made appearances on Ancient Aliens, and, uh, you know, he's actually just a prolific UFO researcher in general. He hired Chan because Chan had ridiculous ideas. That was his reasoning. I, I don't have the exact quote in front of me right now, but he basically said that he hired Chan because of his creative thinking and innovative nature, not really for any of his actual scientific chops. Mm-hmm but because they needed somebody in the room who was going to look at a glowing blue sphere and say something weird until it made sense. What glowing blue sphere? I was pulling something that I, Bob Lazar said out of my ass. Okay, like, got it. Back All right. on the Joe Rogan podcast like okay. three years ago. Wasn't sure. But no, no, there's like no glowing a... blue sphere in this one. Okay. The point is <laughs> that when you, when you get a bunch of people in a room together and they're all rational. Yeah. Nobody's going to say the irrational nonsense that might actually lead you to the conclusion you need. Yep. Um, it's kind of <laughs> like how like fiction will have some wild ideas and yep. then like 20 to 30 years later, science will be like, mm -hmm. it was a good idea and we tried it and believe it or not, we eventually got it to work. It's well, like uh, Star Trek. They have the little communicators, the flip up communicators. Yep. Cell phones. Yep. <laughs> literally cell phones yep 30 years before there were cell phones so you know they needed that guy in the room yeah that guy's important i uh, apparently chan frustrated a lot of his colleagues because Shocking. they'd be sitting there talking about something concrete you know like gravity and he'd walk in and be like what if the earth was soup <laughs> I will say, to be fair... We are but soup stirred by the gods. Concrete, or sorry, concrete. Uh, gravity is very much not concrete. I, okay. I, just just to put that out there. Well, obviously, concrete is a physical thing. That's a good point. And gravity gravity is, is a mystical force that nobody exactly. understands. It's not even real. Why are we talking? <laughs> yeah, no. Who needs gravity? Huh? <laughs> What's the Trisha Paytas video where she's like, you know, I don't think we need gravity. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, and Ethan Klein, who, you know in and of himself is a jackass but that guy is like sitting there like man i am somehow still not the worst person in this room oh my god i just the remember video where she says she doesn't think hitler did anything wrong and you're like oh trisha was it that video or was it i'm trying to remember if it was that or somebody in my own life where somebody said it was like yeah no like gravity would stop working if the earth stopped spinning what 
That was something I remember. I must have been like in my real life, but somebody was really adamantly defending the idea that if the Earth stopped spinning, there would be no I gravity. I do feel like that's how it was explained to me as a child. Really? Probably not by a science teacher. That would make sense. Because I do know that it's it's the mass that attracts, yeah. not the spinning, because technically we should actually be thrown off of the Earth. Exactly. By the, the the centripetal force also plays a role in this story, by the way. Oh, I'm excited. Um, I, I know we're taking a while to get to it, but I just really need to stress that this is not one of those things that the CIA classified because it was true. Well, how much of it is the sanitization versus... I read the 1993 Uncensored Edition as well. Aha. Uh -huh. I read a lot this How'd week. How'd you find the Uncensored Edition? It is on Amazon. Oh, really? For $1,000, which is why I bought the Kindle Edition. Okay, I was going to say, good lord. It was $5. There we go. Amazon bringing us closer to nonsense every day. Yes. Uh, but yeah, this is... This is not a story where it's like somebody exposed the truth and the CIA censored it. I can't figure out why the CIA did anything with this document. Don't get me wrong. It might be because he was working for McDonnell Douglas, except he wasn't yet. But I, I all, all I know is that it was classified in 1966 and he started working for McDonnell Douglas in 1966. So it very well could be that he was working for McDonnell Douglas, that he started working for McDonnell Douglas for a U.S. Air Force contract. Mm -hmm. And the CIA or somebody in the government went, look, if anybody finds out <laughs> that you're the one working for us, this guy is working on UFOs, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems. Yeah. So maybe, and it could have been any, any number of things. It could have been that they were worried this was going to cause mass hysteria because mm -hmm. it was talking about an imminent pole shift that was going to destroy the world. And his standing in, you know, governmental work and then yeah. also his like degrees would be enough yeah. for people to be like, oh, he's right. <laughs> Are you kidding? The Inquirer, like the National Inquirer, the tabloid coming out, like, you know, D U.S. Air Force contractor with degrees from Harvard and Columbia and Dartmouth says such and such things. Yeah. It would have been panic. Yeah. So it could have just been that they went, all right, listen, we're in the middle of a space race. <laughs> we don't need we're this We're fighting right now. a war in an East Asian country I didn't know about until last week. Yeah. I, not me. I'm saying, you know. You're uh, speaking as a person yeah, from the CIA exactly. at the time. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, <laughs> they're probably sitting there going like, uh, we cannot, we cannot have this. Yeah. They're around. just sitting there and they're like, somebody just comes in and is like, chief, you got to check this out. And he's like, Oh, sweet Jesus. Like, no, no, that's out. That's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to be clear that there are any number of reasons why the CIA could have, in fact, censored this document. Yeah. But I, I'll i launch into it, and, <laughs> and this is this is the part of the show where we'll just, what? Somebody said people who bought the 1K book are sweating now. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> who said Panic at the Disco? What? That's amazing. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, this this is where we'll get into the story, and I, I won't. I'll try not to get any more sidetracked than I already have been. Mm -hmm. We the first thing we get is a narrative, and it's it's titled "The Next Cataclysm," and he basically just runs through everything that's going to happen. Yeah, that the the polar the the electromagnetic field of the Earth is going to weaken. The Earth, the crust, is going to slide around on the mantle, and the continents will rearrange themselves. For some reason, he thinks. And this is one thing that has been bothering me all week. Okay. He thinks that the land would move, but the oceans wouldn't, which would cause the water to rush over the continents as they shift into the ocean. The problem is um, the continents aren't uh, like floating on top of the water, and the water is not floating on top of the mantle. It's floating on top of the crust. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure why he thinks the oceans wouldn't also be moving. He says the atmosphere wouldn't necessarily move, which is probably true. I mean, maybe to an extent it's thinking about inertia in the sense of like, if the land is a little bit more tied to the I think you might give it. I think you're giving him too much credit here. Yeah. Because like, he's talking about the entire crust of the earth. Yeah. Going whoosh. Which would include the oceans i see where he's coming from i'm sure that the inertia that. would in fact like when everything moves cause the water to continue moving when, even when the land stops yeah but before it but before, started moving 
in the land move, kind of like if a rock falls in the water. Yeah, I, I know, but he's he's not saying that the ocean is moving to a different extent. He's saying that the the ocean itself does not move. Yeah, it's weird. As if the land were just like a little piece of paper floating on top of the water. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, it's it doesn't make any sense at all. Um so we start there. The you know, and, and he says that this shift where the, the crust just slips, that it's gonna take uh the North Pole and put it at the equator. And that geographically or magnetically? The geographical. Got it. Yeah. That's um the so the in in this version of things, the Earth's axis on which it spins, north and south, the mm-hmm. that remains static. Yeah, and then everything yeah. within that axis r- moves around and rotates. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, no, not the not the mantle, <laughs> oh, yeah. not the core. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah. So just the crust, and then not only does it do that, not only does Greenland end up in the tropics. Mm-hmm. Um, does he know how the plates are structured? Apparently. Yeah, we'll get into it. Okay. Um, not only does Greenland end up in the tropics, it gets there in six to twelve hours. Everything would die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is continents moving at a thousand miles per hour. Yeah, everything would die. Yeah, it would cause massive earthquakes. You'd have mm-hmm. lava leaking out of the ground. Even it, just the whiplash for everything. Yeah, as it it's, started moving. <laughs> yeah, and that's the other thing is like. How does it does it start at a thousand miles an hour? Because if it starts at a thousand miles an hour, the whiplash is going to kill people. Yeah, if it starts at a hundred miles an hour, the but if it kill if people. it's got to accelerate first, and it's going to do this in six hours, that means that the, the plates are traveling a lot faster than a thousand miles per hour. Yeah. So now I'm curious. <laughs> there's a lot of problems here with yes. with his theory. Um. And yeah, so they they end up there, and then he launches, you know, basically he says that this is what happened to Atlantis and Mew, and that there's going to only be a few survivors across the world, and we're going to go into a new Stone Age. And then he goes into the next chapter, which is the Great Floods, and he starts talking about the floods of the past, you know, the the things that have happened to us in history. Um, What are you doing? So the total, uh, we're being generous, I'm curious about the math here. So the total distance between the bottom tip of Greenland and the equator is about 5,100 miles. Yeah. So it would be, assuming acceleration, it'd have to travel a little bit above 1,000 miles an hour. Yep. Uh, oh, also, we'll, we'll get to the the explanation for why, but um, according to him... Uh, Egypt was in the North Pole at one point. Here. Yeah. You want to know why Egypt? Why? It's the Dan Basin. Why? Uh, because on the Piri Reis map, mm-hmm. Egypt is, uh, is in the North Pole. You know what the problem with that is? Mm. On the Piri Reis map, Egypt is not in the North Pole. Oh, where is it? Not on the map because we're missing two thirds of the map. <laughs> um, it cuts off right about uh, like Algeria. Got it. Um, the thing is, the Piri Reis map. He was looking at it horizontally. Ah. Uh, yeah. So that's it's written in Turkish. You can no. Don't, so don't they have like a little? It actually might be Latin. No, I think it's, it's either. I think it's either Arabic or. Turkish. Don't they have a little compass rose in the corner or whatever? Or... Pull, pull, I'll, I'll pull up the race map. Yeah. Um, let me show people what we're talking about here. Um, okay, that's not a full map. Where's the full map? There's the full map. Just just show me the map, man. I don't need, I don't need all this, this nonsense. Okay, uh, which one do we have? Just go here. Okay, there we go. So, as you can see, the map may have in fact been drawn with the east and the north. This was not totally uncommon for maps of the time because we just had a totally different concept of the world. Mm -hmm. This is 21 years after Columbus. We're still learning. Yep. 
and the map was a compilation of other maps that were made long before. One of them might actually be Christopher Columbus's original map of the oh, Caribbean, wow. which we've lost. We don't have it. That's so true. it's believed that the reason that all of this is so accurate down here, which this would be the Caribbean, okay, um, is because he had Columbus's map. So what's impressive is this is a very accurate map, but what you'll notice is this is south over here. Um, let me actually, you know, maybe I can find a version of it that is not um, oriented like that. Uh, oh, with the, that one could well, be. Well, could, this, this shows us. So this shows you how accurate the map is, which it's, it's impressive. Um, <laughs> like. Yeah, it's well done. But yeah, so here, this is that, that's the orientation. Um, if you'll notice down here, South America doesn't go east like nope. that. So a lot of people have suggested that this is Antarctica and that Antarctica was connected to Brazil. In reality, what's far more likely is that he ran out of space. Uh, on the paper. Because at this time, a lot of people thought that the Atlantic Ocean was enclosed. Mm. Uh, it wasn't, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But they weren't necessarily aware of the fact that not everyone was aware of the fact that if you went west, if you went further south, you'd eventually get around. I think Magellan was, uh, do you want to look up when Magellan's voyage was? Yes. Because um, that'll that'll tell us kind of when we figured out that, uh, when we proved the Earth was in fact round. Um, Magellan's voyage was, yeah, so this is six years before Magellan's voyage. Which was September 20th, 1519. Yeah, that was the start date. Um, took him even longer. Yeah. So you look at this map, in its proper orientation, it's very clear that this is not Antarctica and that Antarctica is not depicted without ice, that this is in fact the corner. And if you look at this, it actually, the, the way they've drawn these lines shows you the exact way in which South America is being wrapped around the side here. So it could be that they didn't know, it could be that he ran out of space. There's any number of things, but if the map is shown like this, you might think that that's North it's not, um, but that's the point here. So the, a big a big piece of his whole theory is based on a misunderstanding of a map. Yep. Um, let's see. It's just a podcast. Which is just genuinely impressive at that point. Yeah. Um, that's that's kind of a <laughs> uh somebody said we need dmt to properly understand this probably yep that just seems to be the way it goes doesn't it yeah he so he misunderstands the period Reyes map that's how he figures out that egypt was in sudan or that sudan was in the north pole at some point no yep. which no yeah we'll just let that one be yeah uh he goes on to tell us that noah's flood was one of these cataclysms oh um, 6,500 years ago, and that Adam and Eve, uh, that the story of their creation, or not their creation, but the, the creation story mm -hmm. is not a creation story, it's a survival story. Yeah. Interesting. And that the world has undergone these floods many times. In fact, he does mention the, the sea level rise of 11,600 years ago. Problem is, he, he, we didn't know about Meltwater Pulse 1B yet. We knew about the Younger Dryas. Mm -hmm. Nobody was really sure what caused it. Yeah. Because that, I think, was the, like 2007, I want to say, that, oh, they wow. finally, that, that they finally showed the basically their version of the KT layer. Wow. Uh, yeah, so I think it was 2007, yeah, the Younger Dryas. It was definitively a, an impact that caused that to happen. Mm -hmm. For him... And now it's it's kind of generally believed that it's also what caused Meltwater Pulse One B mm -hmm. was a an impact of some sort probably in Greenland. Mm. Um, that would make sense given mythology because if you look at the way that the Norse talk about uh, Ragnarok, it very much sounds like a asteroid impact because mm. it talks about a uh, basically a, a huge fire engulfing the world and then the the waters of the ocean coming in to quench it. Yeah, so that. If you're in Norway, 
and an asteroid hits Greenland. 10,000 years later, the stories that have been told down are going to sound like the world caught on fire and then the ocean swallowed it. Yep. And if you, if you track it around the world, you kind of get a similar idea. Like, the further away you get from Greenland, the less fire is involved. Yeah. So I'm not saying for certain that a comet did that or that an asteroid did that. But it seems but likely it based seems, off the story. It seems plausible. Yeah. His version of events, on the other hand, where the crust just slips around on top of the, the mantle, a lot less likely. In fact, one might say definitively untrue. Yeah. I... Because how did all of the sediment layers get the way they are everywhere? Um, and and there's there's more to this, by the way. We we have not, by any stretch of the imagination, hit the weirdest part. Considering there's 41 pages of notes, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, according to our friend Chan, there is an... Okay, I... Uh, the the Mayans are the descendants of an ancient group of uh, people called the Naga, who lived uh, somewhere in 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 the eastern hemisphere. Okay. And uh, the the Naga were the original civilization, like Atlantis, Mu, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's the Naga. Okay. And we know this because there are similarities between uh, Naga glyphs and Mayan glyphs. I don't know where the hell he found these Naga glyphs because I can't. It's basically, he's just like, these things exist. And you're like, where? Yeah. And he just does not elaborate. He's basically citing another guy who's citing another guy who's citing yeah. another guy who said they saw some glyphs at some point. I introduce a new prehistoric species or uh, society. Yep. Refuse to elaborate. Literally. And so he he claims that, uh, that the Naga language mm -hmm. survived in its in that it it split off into other languages, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of those languages is Egyptian. All right. Okay, right. Okay. Which is extremely closely related to Greek. Except for the fact that it's not. I was gonna say they're not even the same language family. News to me. Yeah, he says that uh, the Polynesian languages, mm -hmm. the Oriental languages, mm -hmm. uh, Greek, Egyptian, and Yakut are all vestigial variants of the Naga language. We can pretty definitively say today, via etymology, that Greek and Egyptian are not related like that. Mm -hmm. That Greek and Yakut, which is a Turkic language spoken in northeastern Siberia, uh, is not, that these aren't related to each other, that yeah. they develop probably independently, mm -hmm. because Greek is Indo-European, Yakut is Turkic, and Egyptian is Afro-Asiatic. Mm -hmm. None of those are the same language family. I mean, I, I, Turkic might be Indo-European. But it's definitely not Greek. Um, and Yakut's not the, like, the Turkic spoken in Turkey at all. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, basically it's ancient apocalypse on, on roids. Yeah, history, daddy. That's, <laughs> that is precisely what we're dealing with here. Uh, if you took basically everything Graham Hancock says and then... I uh, just added a ton of blatant disregard for science. Yep. Which, again, is weird because this guy's an electrical engineer. But he talks about this Naga society and their history and how they inhabited the land of Mew, mm -hmm. which is the Atlantis of the Pacific. Yeah. And he cites uh, uh, Tiwanaku, I think is the, the name of the town, the name of the city, in... Uh, in the Andes. And he's like, Tuanaku was destroyed um, 11,500 years ago suddenly. Like, the entire, just in the course of a day, mm -hmm. it was abandoned. That sounds a little familiar. Yeah, well, here's the problem. Uh, that was based off of a early 1900s amateur archaeologist's opinion 
based on the position of one of the temples in relation to where the sun would have been on the equinox 15,000 years ago. It does not fit that. The sun would have just been on the stairs. It wouldn't have been going through the like gateway they pointed out. Yeah. Uh, also, this guy was a legitimate Nazi. Oh. Yeah, like... Well, support... that kind of discredits you immediately, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I won't say that much because having bad ideas does not mean that you can't observe facts. True. NASA. In this case... What? Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> The NASA scientists yeah. that, you know, the U.S. just kind of... <laughs> Don't talk about Operation Paperclip. <laughs> um, yeah, so... He says it's that it, the all work was stopped on the city 11,500 years ago, suddenly, in the course of a day. Hmm. Arthur Puznansky, the guy who claimed that the city was that old, did not say that. What did he say? As far as I'm aware. Um, Do we know what, what he said, or is it just... I did not read his work. Okay. Uh, I... Another guy, a little bit later, I have all of these names in my notes, so if you want the, the focused version of this, watch the Friday video, yep. where I have all of the details right in front of me, the notebook's charging. Yes. Um, the downside of electronic notebooks is it doesn't, in fact, have to charge. Uh, later, in the 70s, so 1910 to 1945 is when Poznanski's writing. In the 70s, uh, a guy named, um, I want to say Carlos something, revises it. Okay. Now it's 1500 B.C. Mm -hmm. Much more reasonable. It's been further revised since. They now think that the city began as a ceremonial site mm -hmm. around 200 AD. And that it grew into a city by like 400 AD. Interesting. The scholarship is not suggesting that city is that old. And I'm not saying that it's impossible that the city's that old. Mm -hmm. But there's just no available evidence outside of... 15,000 years ago, I think the sun would have been here. And they probably noticed. Yeah. That is the only evidence he provides. So that's frustrating. Uh, really putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. So he talks about that. He talks about the flood of Noah and the connection with Utnapishtim from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which actually is kind of a legitimate comparison. That's, that's one that scholars make all the time, is that the Utnapishtim of Gilgamesh is probably the Noah of the Bible. Um, oh, interesting. Now, okay. which came first, or if they are even from connected traditions, is yeah. up for debate. Uh, we don't know precisely when the the flood narrative was written down mm -hmm. um, for for the Bible. We do know that the Epic of Gilgamesh, I think, dates to twenty one hundred. Yeah, wasn't in that, its earliest written form. I want to say that was the first. I mean, to my knowledge, from freshman year high school, that, history, that, that, that is known the as the earliest literature. Yeah, okay, yeah, the earliest written sure. literature. So, words. Um, so, Unapishtim and Noah are supposed to be connected. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Abraham in the Bible, this, this is one of those things that a lot of people kind of gloss over. Mm -hmm. Abraham is not from Israel in the Bible. Where's He's from? from Or in Babylonia. Interesting. How or of the Chaldees. How far away is that from far. Israel? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, let's. I'll, I'll I'll see if I can pull up a uh, map really quick here. Uh, Abraham's travels map. Oh wow! Yeah, here we go. The man moved. If it'll if it'll load for me. Come on, just <laughs> I love it. It's on. Uh, that's a great. Just make the make. Oh my god! Uh, welcome to Pinterest, man. Okay, there we go. So. That's, uh, Abraham starts down, oh my god, it's doing a thing. Um, let me see, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna pull up a different version of this. Uh, here we go, nice, nice simple one for you. So, Ur, down here, Uruk is believed to be the, the first city in Mesopotamia. Oh, Ur, right down here, might be the other, might also be the first city. Mm -hmm. He's born here. He lives here. This is where he grows up. Yep. And then he goes up here to Haran, which is uh, now Syria, I think. Mm -hmm. And he stays there for a little while. And then he goes down to Israel. Interesting. Which at this time, before he gets here, is just Canaanite. Am I am I seeing Memphis in there? Yeah. That's a biblical... Well, I mean, it's it? Egyptian. Interesting. Yeah, so... Hmm. Yeah, so this is, you know, Abraham goes all over the place. So it makes sense that 
the early Jewish stories would be similar to Mesopotamian ones. Because mm -hmm. the first Jew was from Mesopotamia. Interesting. So, or the first person to be considered the, the, the father of Judaism, I guess, is the way you would put that, was from Mesopotamia. Interesting. So, of course, thousands of years later, yep. you're going to have stories from Mesopotamia and from Israel that mm -hmm. are extremely similar, not because the Jews, like, found... The, uh, the, the common thread here that everyone draws is, oh, well, the Jews had the Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. That's where they picked up all of these Babylonian myths. Probably not. <laughs> it was probably way back then. Yeah. Because this is about a thousand years before Moses. Really? Yeah. Wow. I. Uh, so it is very possible that Abraham knew a lot of the same stories. Yeah. That the earliest Mesopotamian stories about Noah, for mm -hmm. example, Utnapishtim in their case, would feature the same character. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, it's uh, uh, Utnapishtim lives off beyond the Sea of Death um, in Gilgamesh, which I don't know precisely what that means. Um, the Dead Sea? Well, we call it the Dead Sea. Yeah, but I mean, like... It might be. Yeah, um, considering the reason why it's called the Dead Sea. Well, here's the thing. What you just did is why we have the Adam and Eve story. What do you mean? When you just said, well, oh, we call it the Dead Sea, you know, maybe they called the, 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 he. That is the entire thing he does throughout this entire book fair but mine is more specifically i wasn't i wasn't like calling you the same as him i was just no, saying I that's know. the exact process we get here is yes. it's like words that sound similar but aren't actually connected that he doesn't know that fair which mine, granted it was 1965 it was a lot harder but fair. mine was less about the etymology though and the fact that like the dead sea is called the dead sea because things can't live in it. oh yeah definitely yeah yeah so that's it's possible that's what it was yeah um draws the unapishtim and noah parallel talks about the flood and says that the uh, that that Noah basically was the same as Vishnu, that Vishnu also was a real person who survived a flood mm -hmm. seventy thousand years ago, um, and that's that's why he becomes a, a deity, I guess. Mm -hmm. He does the same thing with several other figures, but of course, this is the Adam and Eve story. Yeah. So what's the Adam and Eve narrative here? Well, Adam. 11,500 years ago, uh, lives, or I guess not 11,500 years ago. Uh, this this is the other issue, is that it, his retelling of Genesis um, gets weird. But basically 11,500 years ago, uh, the Adam is a survivor of one of these cataclysms. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, the cataclysm does not destroy the entire world. Just Mew. Uh, <laughs> Which is weird. That doesn't make any sense. Also, Eve is not his wife. Eve is his daughter. Just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Yep. Because uh, Adam's first wife was Lilith. Ah. So, why does he think that? It has to do with his fundamentally flawed understanding of Scripture. I was going to say, because, like, haven't we acknowledged several times that Lilith isn't yeah. in the Bible? She's not. Where does she come from again? Uh, the Alphabet of Ben Sirah, uh -huh. which is a 8th uh, century AD work mm -hmm. that is likely, I haven't read it, but from what I understand is uh, is actually possibly just supposed to be a satire. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Where else is Lilith? Is Lilith in Enoch? Lilith is not in Enoch. Lilith is only in Ben Sirah, and then some Babylonian stories have a character named Lilith. Interesting. Yeah. It's but weird the whole Adam's Lilith... first wife thing. It's weird that Lilith has such a heavy presence considering Lilith is in so few actual extant documents. Yeah. It's weird. It is weird. Um, thing is, he does it multiple times. It's not just Lilith. He does the same thing with... Uh, God, who is it? Um, oh, Ezra from the Bible, who mm -hmm. is a priest. Keeps referring to him as a high priest. Mm -hmm. That's up for debate. Um, there's Ezra is just kind of listed as a priest. Okay. Uh, his, one of his ancestors was a high priest. Mm -hmm. He takes Ezra and he mixes up the book of Ezra, mm -hmm. which is in the Old Testament, with First and Second Ezra's which are both also about Ezra, mm -hmm. but written in the 2nd century AD. Interesting. Book of Ezra 
is supposed to be the 400s BC. Mm. Either 458 or 404, I think, are the the dates. Or no, 4, 458 or 397. Because the king that's named, the Persian king is named as uh, Artaxerxes. And there's two Artaxerxes. Mm-hmm. There's one who ruled in, four, in the seventh year of his reign was 458. And one mm-hmm. who the seventh year of his reign was 397. So those are the two time periods in which Ezra could have lived. Uh, based on the fact that he leads a bunch of Jews back to Israel. Mm-hmm. It's probably the 458 date. But later scholarship has been moving the date mm-hmm. forward in time. Um that's a problem because he takes the information in second Esdras as if it is in Ezra. Mm -hmm. There's a reason Esdras is not in the Bible. There's a reason that it's attached as Apocrypha. Mm -hmm. It's that when a story is considered Apocrypha, there's a a few possible reasons. One is that it contains information that is both true and information that is untrue and therefore doesn't count as canon. It's valuable because of the stuff that's true, but because it's not entirely held as true, it's not included. So with Second Esdras, that's why it's not in the book, is because it's not it's not considered accurate, mm-hmm. or at least not considered wholly accurate. Got it. If they didn't think it was wholly accurate when it was written, they it probably wasn't. Fair. Um, so Esdras is not. You, you can't do that. It's like using Enoch. To explain Genesis. Mm. It's the same thing. Yeah. He claims, and this is important, the the Ezra narrative is important, because he claims that Ezra rewrote the entire Bible. From memory. Basically, what we get is that he says that in 586, or 587, depending on which year it actually happened, Mm -hmm. the Babylonians conquered Israel. Mm -hmm. Judah, specifically, they already conquered Israel. They conquered Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel, of the Israelites. It's the one that kept the monotheism, um, and therefore it's not destroyed the first time. Yeah. Uh, the Babylonians capture it. They burn the city to the ground. They destroy everything. They execute uh, Sariah, the high priest. They take out the king's eyes. Like, it's pretty brutal. Yeah. Take a whole bunch of Jewish nobles, basically the entire ruling class of Jews, and they take them to Babylon... Because the plan is to educate them in the Babylonian ways and then send them back so that they'll rule as Babylonians mm. over their own people. It was a very common system for the time, was to, to take the, the young ruling class, educate them, and then send them back. The Romans did it extremely effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Babylonians did the same thing. He makes the assumption, based on stuff that's in Second Esdras, that there were no written documents surviving that none of the written accounts of Jewish history Mm -hmm. survived and that the last person to actually see the physical documents written by Moses who is held as the traditional author of the Torah Mm -hmm. there's another theory called the JEDP theory uh, the uh, documentary hypothesis it's up for debate Mm -hmm. Um, I don't totally love it uh, for a number of reasons But he holds that all documentation was destroyed and that Ezra was simply remembering what his dad, Sariah, told him. Problem is Sariah died in 586 and the very earliest date that Ezra could have been writing was 458. Hmm. That doesn't track very well, does it? No, he had to have been at least 127 years old. Yeah. I mean, granted, just... To be devil's advocate there, ages in the Bible, specifically early on in Genesis. But this is the 400s. And that's the thing. Is like, I could see where he's coming with these ideas if he like briefly skimmed Oh, even he doesn't do that though. What do you mean? Ready? Yeah. So he first presents, all right, well, if Ezra was the son of Sariah, Mm -hmm. who died in 587, then the earliest Ezra could have been born was 587. Mm Mm-hmm. Um... And he, or sorry, the the youngest he could possibly be is 127 years old because he would have been born in 587, Mm -hmm. um, like within nine months of his dad dying. So instead, he posits that Ezra's dad was Sariah, but the Bible got it wrong. Sariah was not the high priest who was killed in Mm -hmm. Israel or in Judah. Instead, it wasn't even uh, 
Azariah, Sarai's dad, might have been him. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it was probably Helkia. Helkia, I think is his name. I don't have it in front of me. Helkia. And who was that? Uh, in the genealogy of Ezra, Ezra's great-grandfather. Okay. Therefore, what we get is not Ezra being 127, mm -hmm. but instead a normal age because his great-grandfather was 127 years older than he was or something. Um, here's the problem. In the Bible, all the time, son of will be used to reference an important ancestor. Mm. Jesus is called the son of David. Mm -hmm. Jesus is quite obviously not the son of David. Very much not, yeah. He's a thousand years removed. I was going to say, <laughs> like, how many generations is that? Yeah, a thousand years. So often and especially in the very poetic Old Testament, mm -hmm. terms like that will be used. It might be that Ezra, that Sariah was Ezra's grandfather or great-grandfather, mm -hmm. but that Ezra's father and grandfather, either their names were unknown or they weren't important, mm -hmm. something like that. If you're missing that genealogy, because the last person you can trace Ezra to is Sariah, mm -hmm. then you say son of Sariah. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not definitive, that is not every time son of is used in the Bible. It is sometimes used to mean specifically a father-to-son relationship. Yeah. But there are also times, and I checked this with Father Peter. Mm -hmm. uh, he said he thinks I'm right on this one. Mm -hmm. um, that son of is going to mean descendant of. Yeah. This seems to be one of those cases. That is the far more likely explanation. Yeah. Um, it fits within the it fits within Jewish tradition. It fits within the time period. Like that would make sense. Yeah. Uh, instead, he gives this version where the Bible got those things wrong, but then it, by extension, you could argue it got a whole bunch of other things wrong within the same story. Yeah, fair. traces it back to uh, you know Aaron and Moses and all that. That also is not how Ezra knew what to write down. Ezra is considered often to be the guy who finalized the Torah. Mm -hmm. That previously it probably existed in several versions that might have varied slightly mm -hmm. uh or that it was just oral tradition we don't know precisely when this stuff was written down for the first time it was generally believed that it was during the babylonian captivity mm -hmm. and then that that's been pushed back possibly by the discovery of that tablet in israel that i talk about all the time got it um because that's written in hebrew and it says yahweh curse you i was gonna say is that the one on the yeah. mountain got it got yeah it. so that's what was tentative, it called again uh the mount ebal tablet it's right dated uh pending peer review it's dated to around 1200 bc okay which lines up with the exodus the jews getting to israel mm -hmm. all of that yeah obviously not precisely 1200 or bc but um yeah so there's there's that whole issue his version of how ezra wrote it all down is not even the version that's in second esdras this idea that Helkiah was the last guy to see, or Azariah, one of those two was the last guy to see the written documents, to study the written Torah, and then pass it down orally to Sariah and then to Ezra. Mm -hmm. That's his version. Mm -hmm. The version in 2nd Esdras, oh, and also he dictated it to five scribes, mm -hmm. um, even though he himself is known as Ezra the scribe. Yeah. Because he writes. Um, scribes usually don't need scribes. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. So he mixes it, he mixes the gap from Ezra between the, the basically the the time gap that's unaccounted for between Sariah and Ezra. He mixes that with Second Esdras, but he gets the way that it was compiled wrong because Esdras says that basically it was divine revelation mm -hmm. that Ezra was dictating to scribes because God was speaking directly to him. Ezra is not a prophet. Ezra is not referenced as a prophet. Mm -hmm. Ezra is a priest. Priests and prophets serve very different functions. Yeah. Um, so he makes the assumption based on Second Ezra that Ezra was a, pre a prophet, that mm -hmm. he dictated that way. If you read the book of Ezra and mm -hmm. the book of Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah, it's pretty clear that either this was oral tradition that was passed down and then Ezra wrote it down mm -hmm. because the king of Persia asked him to, mm -hmm. uh, or that they all, they had the documents yeah. and that Ezra just compiled them. One of those two is far more likely than the version where 
all the names were wrong and it was passed down orally and yeah. yeah it got mixed up and everything no and if you look at it because there's this is not the only uh important jewish history that happens during that period because daniel is in babylon yeah. um from 586 to his mm -hmm. death so daniel's daniel's there there's a prophet there it, they didn't kill off all of the learned men it wasn't like the high priest was the only guy who knew anything about the story. Mm -hmm. And it's not like Ezra was the only priest. Ezra was from the priestly class. The Pharisees, as they would become later. Or, uh, not, that might be the Sadducees. I might be mixing those two up. Um, I think it's the Pharisees, yeah. So, he's from the priestly class. Mm -hmm. Class. An entire class of people who were all trained in the same information. Mm -hmm possibly several hundred to a few thousand of them. Yeah, that's a lot. It's very unlikely that Ezra was working alone based on memory from stuff his dad passed down to him from his grandfather. Yeah. Makes far more sense to assume that Ezra had something to work with. At the very least, maybe he was the scribe because he and a whole bunch of other priests collaborated. Yeah. And that's, when you look at how Judaism has worked throughout history with how they record things, that is what they do, is they will take, this is how the Septuagint was written, traditionally, is they took 70 different Jewish scholars, 70 different priests, who all translated the Torah into Greek, separately, the whole thing, and then they compared notes. Probably how this happened, too. So, he mixes up narratives, mm -hmm. he misunderstands several things. Um, does not consider the fact that Daniel was there, like not during Ezra's life, but yeah. but Daniel was there. So they had a prophet. <laughs> um, and then it gets weirder because we go further back and Moses, who is a prophet, his brother Aaron is the priest. Once mm -hmm. again, we notice that these are two different things, don't yeah. we? Moses was raised in the royal household in Egypt, mm -hmm. where he had access to the sacred Egyptian secret tablets mm -hmm. written in the Naga glyphs, which is also what the Book of the Dead is from, apparently. Interesting. Uh, so, yeah, um, according to Thomas, Chan Thomas, uh, Moses was shown these glyphs. He wasn't a prophet. Mm -hmm. He was just a guy. He yep. was shown these glyphs. But because he couldn't read the language, mm -hmm. he just went based on the symbolism. Mm. So there's a tree, you know, a woman, a man, a yep. serpent, all these symbolized things in the ancient Naga language. He does not explain how he knows that at all, whatsoever. Naturally. Instead, he just says, ah, yeah, they were in the Naga language. That's it. We're good. We're done. Yeah, you know, and Moses and Aaron, they just they just didn't know what it said. So then he finally gives us his rewritten version of events, mm -hmm. wherein Adam is a man who lives in Eden, in the motherland, in what is probably Mew, the continent Mew, mm -hmm. um, which does not exist, <laughs> at least does not anymore. We're not going to get into that. Yeah, but not here. Certainly does not exist now. Um, Adam lived there. And God is still involved, but in this case, God is not actively creating everything. Mm -hmm. God has simply designed the world and then basically hit start. Why would God design a world where every 10,000 years the entire planet reshapes itself and kills almost everybody on the planet? Don't know. But that's a whole other theological question about free will and, yes. you know, there's the, the, that would take hours to, to yeah. talk about. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get into that on the next Weird Bible. Yeah, exactly. So, like, why, you know, why is suffering a thing? Um, <laughs> so why would he do that? But also, between chapter one and chapter two of his retranslation, and I love his method, um, he takes the English mm -hmm. Bible. Yeah. Based on that, he derives from the English, what the original Naga glyphs would have been. And then translates, so he translates English to Naga, mm -hmm. and then reinterprets the Naga back into English. So, for example, trees in Naga, apparently, uh, represent civilizations. 
mm-hmm. societies. So tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil, tree of knowledge of good and evil becomes society that understands good and evil through his translation process. Interesting. If you're noticing, there's a problem here. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Naga doesn't exist. <laughs> so Slight issue there. Yeah, he's basically basing this off of what we know about Mayan runes. Yeah. Or Mayan glyphs, I guess. Um, which, I, by the way, I am not a, a prehistoric America guy. Mm-hmm. I'm not even sure that he's right about <laughs> what the Mayan ones mean. Yeah. He might be. Um, as far I don't know though. Well, how much has he been right about? So, but then what he's but here's what he's doing, like exactly. But look at it. So basically, what you're doing then is you're you're taking English, translating it into Mayan, and then retranslating it back into English. Hebrew has at no point been involved here. Nope. The language in which it was written. He also says that he translated from uh from Naga back into English, skipping the Hebrew and Greek steps. Do you know what the problem is there? Oh, uh, doesn't it defeat the whole purpose? No, the Old Testament wasn't written in Greek at any point. The original. Yeah, it was translated to Greek yep. from... From Hebrew. Yeah. So if you why... were going to do that, you wouldn't use the English. You'd compare the Hebrew to the Mayan, which I guess is Naga. So, so, so this is what I mean, though. Like, yeah, yeah. He's taking... The translation of the translation, well, I, I mean, if you're going with the, the KJV, then you're taking the translation. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, he's taking the translation from, at the very least, Hebrew into English. Yeah. And then he's <laughs> translating the English into Mayan in order to reconstruct Naga, and then translating the Naga back to English. We should if get... you really wanted to do this, you'd, you'd want to do Hebrew to Mayan... We should get the picture of Charlie from It's yeah. Always Sunny with the board with the strings on it. Yeah. It's like, no, it, it's Naga. It makes sense. Yeah, that's brutal. So, yeah, that's... uh, That is his excuse for why uh, Genesis is quote-unquote wrong. The amount of mental gymnastics that oh, you yeah. have to put yourself through to like even believe yourself mm-hmm. at that point is genuinely impressive. This is one of those cases where somebody tried to disprove religion with science and managed to get science wrong. Yep. Um, well, because they didn't understand either, it seems. Well, you'd think he would only, understand science. The only thing he understands well in this entire thing is electromagnetic properties. Yeah. Because he's an electrician yeah. or an electrical engineer. Yeah. That's all he's got. Yep. Everything else was amateur research. In the Uh, 60s. And incomplete at that. Yeah. So, what we get at the end is a story about how Adam is an inhabitant of Mew, Mm -hmm. 11,500 years ago, 11,600 years ago now, um, and that that's where Eden is, Mm -hmm. and that uh, God did not create everything then. That God created everything 4.5 billion years ago. Yeah. Um, (sighs) Of course... There's, there's more issues with within the chronology. Uh, Fair but enough. We'll get into those on, on the Friday one. In the in his version of Genesis, God is just kind of like sitting back letting everything happen. Mm-hmm. Which, of course, if God was sitting back and letting everything happen, why the hell did they write it down in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> also, like, kind of negates a lot of, you know, Genesis. Yeah, and the purpose of God. like because that's the other thing is like you then gotta why only do this with the first three chapters yeah then you, if you're gonna do it you gotta do it with all 30 some chapters of genesis yeah you can't really cherry pick and that's what he does he cherry picks the first three yeah uh it says that adam lives in eden that eden was created by this is the other weird thing is that chapter one is basically rewriting the six days of creation mm-hmm. still six days yeah but now it's because the land is moving yeah uh six days of creation and then says that Mm -hmm. after the last after that tumble he calls it Mm -hmm. the the earth was laid out the way it is in genesis one or genesis two okay adam is introduced in genesis two he claims that the creation of man story Mm -hmm. in in genesis one is not the same story as the creation of adam interesting yeah uh, that it's just talking about mankind in general in the first one and then Adam in the second one. 
Adam has a wife. The wife dies in childbirth, giving birth to Eve. Mm -hmm. Adam raises Eve. Eve somehow has ancestral knowledge about the coming uh, the coming cataclysm. Oh, um, sorry. This is sorry. This is right. I was going to say that was a new detail. Sorry, I I, I I mixed this up uh, because it's really confusing to read. Um, Adam lives just before. 11,500 BC. Ah. So he, he's living through the cataclysm. Mm -hmm. Eve, uh, rather than having the serpent tell her things, uh, the serpent symbolizes the ocean. And she just has ancestral knowledge about what's going to happen. And Moses and Aaron didn't get it because they were just looking at pictures of trees. And like serpents and stuff and trying to... They get that specific? Or he gets that specific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the the tree of good the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a society that understands good and evil. The serpent is the ocean. Um, the the rib is just apparently in the Naga the Naga script. A curved line indicates uh, parentage. So it's not a rib. It's just a it's a line, line denoting a family tree. Got yeah, it. denoting a family tree. Um. Eve talks to Adam and is like, you know, hey, this thing's going to happen. Adam talks to God and God's like, yeah, I mean, you can leave. And then they, they leave and the, the whole place collapses behind them. It also says that the four rivers that go out of Eden, um, he changes that to four lands that are by rivers. And he also says, oh, to be my favorite, there's a note inserted. He says that uh, the next, this is right after Genesis 2.10. He said, or Genesis 110, I think. 110? 210? 210. Um, he says that uh, the next four verses might be inaccurate. <laughs> um, wow. Because Moses and Aaron didn't really understand what was in the tablet. And that uh, the four rivers are actually four lands by rivers. And that's what they were trying to, what's, that's what the Naga were trying to tell us. Does he make... A suggestion as to what those lands are? It doesn't matter because they're going to get... Oh, yeah, they're all... Assumed. Yeah. So, yeah, they basically they leave Eden. All of that oh. happens. Um, I forget what happens in his version of Chapter 3. It goes, like, off the rails. Um, even more so. Oh, yeah, even more so. Man, I can't wait to edit this video. It's going to be interesting. But, yeah. And then the, the end result is that Adam and Eve survive. I... Uh, Incest is not explicit, but it is kind of implied. Heavily implied. Uh, and somehow being father to daughter rather than gender swapped clone is worse. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why it is, but it, I, it think, is. I think the power dynamic there makes it yeah. a little bit worse as well. So. Yeah. Um, oh, God. And anyway, then they, they repopulate, on. and then a thousand years later. It happens again. This time, Noah's the survivor. And according to him, this has happened over and over and over and over again throughout history, which is why there are so many different flood myths. Because mm. God forbid it be that there was one really bad flooding incident and everyone remembered. No, it must be. It must, in fact, be that there were multiple and one guy lived through each one yeah. to tell the tale. But... That is the whole story. Again, you're going to get a, a much more condensed and, well, I don't know about condensed, but a, a much more thorough and focused version of that yeah. uh, on Friday where when I have my notes. Uh, <laughs> buckle in. Buckle in, kids. It's going to be a doozy. <laughs> and it's sponsored by Surf, Surfshark. Um, oh, well, so yeah. that's this week's sponsor. Yeah, Fun. VPN. Love that. Um, yeah, guys, we finally did it a couple weeks ago. We finally got Raid Shadow Legends we to did. sponsor a video. We're officially YouTubers We've now. Made it. We've made it. We've made it. But it is 8.11, 8.12, so yeah, we should go to Super Chats. Let's do it. Uh, the first one is from Lily's Hazel Eyes, and it is for you. looks like a little bit of coffee. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. We did have some coffee before this because we, in fact, needed yeah. it. Uh, and it's already wearing off. Uh, your boy for 199 said, uh, Bussy, Bussia, Bussica, Busha, Bussia. Bussia? Bush CIA? 9-11? Was bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's a family guy reference. Yes, it was. 
Uh, Plaz, member for 13 months. Look at you over a year. Well done, Plaz. Thank you. Uh, you also put the documents you're talking about up on the Patreon. Heck, add a page for sources you're using so we can look Ooh, deeper into stuff. That's, that's not a bad idea, yeah. That's a great idea. I can definitely put them up. I mean, these ones are really easy to find. But Yeah, fair. Weren't you also going to put your notes up either on Patreon yeah, or website? Yeah, eventually, I got it. Point? Yeah. yeah, they are going to go up on Patreon. Um, possibly in note form, possibly in like blog post form. Fair. Uh, that Dexy guy for $5 said, It's funny to me that people are shocked that 21-year-old airmen had access to classified uh, intelligence. <laughs> Interpret that how you will. <laughs> He's talking about the the leak. Oh, yeah. 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 Remember when I went on PKA and said that Russia wasn't losing as badly as the media was saying and that we had troops on the ground mm -hmm. in Ukraine? Yeah. And all, all three hosts laughed at me and their entire audience on Reddit, like, tried to flame me for it. Yep. And I was right. Yep. It's Hi, Woody. <laughs> hey, bud. You want to have me back on to apologize? I'll come. <laughs> That's going to get clipped. Uh, you too, Kyle. FPS Russia, come on, man. Uh, you used to be magnificent. What happened? Uh, the feds arrested him and, you know, took all he had and beat him until he liked them, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't help anybody standing, yeah. does it? I like how he did all those gun videos and they couldn't get him on anything illegal with the guns and then it got him for, like, weed. I mean... <laughs> It's not an uncommon tactic. Look at Capone. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I said about that, too. Yeah. Uh, Molten Amber 85 for 199 said, Reversing polls, wasn't that the plot of the core? I don't know. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Or I didn't, I, and I will say, I did not dislike Taylor um, to whoever just said I'd like Taylor one on one. He seems like he's a chill dude. Yep. Agamemnon's gym bag for $5 said, Sounds like dude discovered the wisdom because he has a, he was a subject of MK Ultra." Wait, that would actually totally explain why the CIA had the document. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a pretty... That's a pretty intelligent person to try MK Ultra on. Isn't that all... I mean... Manson was dumb. Yeah, but isn't that a prime person to try it on? I guess. Because, like, it doesn't really benefit you to make a dumb person whatever you think MK Ultra would do. Mind control? To an extent. Probably a lot easier to do mind control on stupid people. Easier, yes, but probably you have a lot more opportunities at your disposal if True, you're someone yeah. with high capability and intelligence. True. Maybe. I mean, I, I'm curious about that. That would be interesting. Yeah, I would like to be... I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and see if there's any possibility that he was actually involved with yeah. it. Quattro for $5 said, We need y'all to do an Indiana Jones type series. Go out and find some stuff. We want to. We, we love to. We have to. pitched it to like three different producers. Yep. Um, apparently 185,000 guaranteed viewers is not something they're interested in Convince in Hollywood. Convince them you're guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We just need to keep growing and keep figuring out what exactly we're going to make this into. Uh, we've got ideas. It's just a matter of our capability to do so. Cakes for four ninety nine said, My Nana loves your coffee. I got it for her for Christmas. Everyone get your Nana some Mount Pocono perk. Thank you. Do you want to show them the yeah. Mount Pocono yeah, yeah. perk? It really is fantastic. It's it's my go-to coffee oh, as well. Well, I'm not touching that bag again. <laughs> that's uh, that's what we were drinking earlier. Yes, uh, we actually do drink our own coffee, and we don't get it for free. Like it's really the only coffee I drink at this good point. Good coffee. Like if I run out of it, I'll dip into the Wawa coffee I have sitting there. It's, but... I think it's decently priced too. Yeah, and by it's the time yeah, it's like twenty bucks a bag once you pay for shipping. No, yeah, it's not bad. Cameron Hughes for ten dollars said this entire native or sorry this entire narrative looks like what would happen if you had a basic understanding of all these subjects and tried to connect it without doing any research whatsoever. Basically, yep. I think that's what happened. Yep, probably. Your boy for 999 said, have y'all thought about making a video on Slender Man? I feel like it would fit nicely with the rake video, maybe related to the Uncanny Valley or even just talk about the attempted murder. Bushy. Yeah, we could definitely do Slender Man. Yeah. That's easy enough to connect to real life stuff too. Yeah. There's a guy I had a, uh, a screenwriting class with in college who was writing a story based on the Slender Man, like universe and yeah. mythos. Well, there's also the real Curious life Slender Man thing that happened as well. well. Yeah. So that could be. Yeah, what good... are you talking about? Like the Slender Man, like murders that happened. Oh yeah. What? Oh yeah. Huh. Uh huh. Have things to look into. Yep. No, no. There's. It's not just online anymore. Somebody made it a thing. This is why we can't have nice things. Yep. 
This is what the internet does to people. Because stop writing fiction in case somebody decides it's a good idea. <laughs> Just depends on what kind of fiction you're writing. Erotic. <laughs> erotic Slenderman fiction? It exists and you know it. It's somewhere out there. Slenderotica? It's even got a catchy title. Yeah, damn. That's a shame. Uh, Casey Sh Scherer? We guess? can't read that. Uh, for 99. Re re redact. Redact. Uh, one part of it. Fair. Hey, dudes, I love eating pasta and watching your pod and listening to your podcast. Keep up the great work. Oh, I love thank you. Eating pasta. And thank you, Casey. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew Holloway for $2 said, do you all need a person knowledgeable in science? I mean, as a occasional reference source? Yeah, yeah why not? I mean, I guess we could, we could start. Right? This is a, here, Let me be honest about the biggest problem we have when it comes to uh, getting help with things. I start researching these oh, two weeks before they go up. Yep. Yeah, we run on a really tight schedule. Yeah. And I don't have two weeks to research. I research a week before we film. Yeah. So by the time I know that I need help, it's a little too late to ask for it. I have been getting better. I've started reaching out to like when we do a missing 401 case, I reach out to the police at the beginning of the week. Yeah. Then usually I've been able to get their their input by the end of the week. Yep. Um, but no, it is, it is simply that I am... Uh, as good at organizing as uh, the Nazis were at human rights. So. Which is why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> to help try and provide some level of organization. And I think it's working so far. Uh, Norbert Rodriguez Jr. for $2 says, It was the 60s, not every intellectual That's is true. reliable. Great point. Other great point. It's 2023 and not every intellectual is reliable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's a lot of quanti quantity over quality yeah. nowadays. Uh, Jack Garcia for four ninety nine said, "I'm not able to get my mind around eighty percent of what you said, but I'm intrigued." Oh, I promise you, outside of the theology and history aspects, I was very confused this entire yeah. time. Yeah, fair. Like I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm reading about like electromagnetism. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here like insane clown posse, like fucking magnets. How do they work? <laughs> that's that's me. Love it. Oh, the Shroud of Turin. That would be a good one to cover for Weird Bible, actually. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. I uh, to put it simply, um, there is a death shroud, basically what you would put over somebody's body after they die, mm -hmm. that is alleged to be the one that was placed over the body of Christ. Oh, interesting. And that his figure is still imprinted on it. Oh, oh I yeah. have heard of this. If you want to read the next one, I'll, I'll pull up a. That was the next one. Um, oh. <laughs> um, well, I guess start looking through uh, through Thank the chat you, for. Lousy. So yeah, I'll looking through the chat for, uh, for good other ones. We got another uh, Inquisitive minutes. said, maybe Adam was an Argonaut, Lilith, Medea, and Eve, the second wife. I can see where you're coming from. The timing doesn't line up, unfortunately. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the Shroud of Turin. Mm. So if you look at it, there appears to be if a you, man. If you look at it, Jesus appears to have been radioactive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's un, it's, it is it's unconfirmed. Uh, let's see. Um, purported... It has been pre preserved since 1578 in the Royal Chapel of the Cathedral of San Giovanni Battista in Turin, Italy. Um, emerged historically in 1354 when it was recorded in the hands of a famed knight, Geoffrey de Charnay. Um, it was announced as false in 1389. Um. Scholarly analyses attempting to use scientific methods to prove or disprove its authenticity have been applied to the shroud since the late 19th century. Uh, it was noticed early that the sepia tone images on the shroud seem to have the character of photographic negatives rather than positives. Beginning in the 1970s, tests were made to determine whether the images were the result of paints or other pigments, scorches or other agents. None of the tests proved conclusive. 
1988, the Vatican provided three laboratories in different countries with postage stamp sized pieces of the shroud's linen cloth. Having subjected these samples to carbon-14 dating, all three laboratories concluded that the cloth of the shroud had been made sometime around 12, sometime between 1260 and 1390. However, some scientists raised doubts about the researcher's methodology. Upon receiving the results of the test, the Vatican encouraged scientists to conduct further investigations of the shroud's authenticity and recommended that Christians continue to venerate the shroud as an inspiring image of Christ. Well, there you have it. Uh, next one's from Agamemnon's Gym Bag for $50. Ooh, thank you, Agamemnon's Gym Bag. Saying, glad to catch y'all on a Sunday night again while I cook my chicken fried rice incorrectly. Here's for the streams I missed. You, thank you. What do you mean incorrectly? Yeah, how... What happened? <laughs> <laughs> how improperly was this chicken fried rice cooked? Did you put all the bits together before they were cooked? And did the chicken fry the rice? Did the rice fry the chicken? That's probably what it was. Yeah. Yeah. That's a rookie mistake. Speaking of getting fried, there's a lot of people that were frying you for not knowing about the Slender Man murders. I realize that is the kind of thing I probably <laughs> should know about. Like, of all the people, I should probably know about that. <laughs> but you know what? This is... this. I will soon. This whole channel is all about learning. I will know soon. We don't know everything. So we're learning. Yeah. We're learning as we go. ETT for four ninety nine said, interestingly, William Milton Cooper, dude who wrote Behold a Pale Horse, mentions the MK Ultra program being used to the big on the big boys in the military. Define big boys. Yeah, I'm I'm curious if you mean like leadership or if you mean physically the big boys. <laughs> MK Ultra, the original creatine. Yeah. <laughs> or roids. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I hope not. Uh, that is not a weightlifting or nutrition suggestion or promotion. <laughs> just, to, just to make it, you know, crystal. Uh, Agamemnon's gym bag for $2 said, I grill my chicken because barbecue. Uh, I mean, that sounds like a good combo. That sounds fine to me. Yeah. Mm. What would chicken you... grilled rice? What would, I mean, I pan fry it, but grilled sounds great. Yeah, watch out for your pans, history daddies in the chat. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> I'm allowed to make that joke. That's fair. You're close enough friends at this point. <laughs> uh, You've been on show a few times. Yeah, it's true. Uh, <sighs> what else we got here? Uh, Anything. That's what I'm looking for. I, I'm going to pull up the Slenderman murders thing on the other screen while you look. You can probably take a couple more. Uh... Of course, it's Waukesha. What? Waukesha, Washington. Or Wisconsin. Oh. Um, oh! Yeah. I did know about this one. Yeah, remembering it now? I did know about this one. You said murders like there were multiple. That It's just generally referred to as the Slender Man murder. I think there was more than one, at least, attempt. Is this the same? Mm, I think so, yeah. Nearly fatal stabbing of a friend, she said, it was mm. crime that was carried out to gain the favor of a sinister fictional character called Slender Man. <laughs> Your boy said, so, Slender C video soon? Oh, good God. Also, a lot of people are just saying, hey, do see? Oh, well, uh, why? I don't know. Did I, what did I do? Uh... Ask Me Bird Girl said it, and then a lot of other people said it. So, keeping you abreast of the situation. Uh, Ask Me Bird Girl. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, uh, she was sentenced to 25 years in the Winnebago Mental Health Institute. Interesting. I remember Mr. Bike said, not a murder, pretty sure a girl survived. Yeah, it was definitely a stabbing attempt. From I remember yeah. there was conflicting reports about it, whether they died. Looks, from what I'm seeing, it does look like uh, it was an attempted murder. Yeah. Um, how did they <laughs> stab somebody 19 times and fail to kill them? That's like miraculous, honestly. Uh, just the bleeding alone. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, History Daddy said, I murdered Slender Man because he wouldn't uh, let me have his pans. <laughs> Precisely what I was expecting to read. Oh, uh, as he should be. 
Uh, Norberto Rodriguez Jr. for five dollars said Polybus was an MK Ultra experiment using Please. video games as a, a brainwashing tool as the military was attempting to train troops with games. I got. I mean say, that just tracks. I'm surprised they don't have like drones or tanks or like other non like human operated equipment or directly operated equipment mm -hmm. just running on like xbox controllers or pc at this point uh, i think they actually do run some of the drones on xbox controllers really yeah but like you'd think they did that with tanks too well tanks are a little bit more complicated a little bit yeah but like you're still looking through a lot of like primarily screens and things like that JSR 10 for, or sorry, JSR for $10 said, favorite book of the Bible. Bit off topic, but always been curious. Also, when's the next weird Bible podcast? I can never keep up. One second. We're, we're confirming whether or not Xbox controllers are utilized by the U.S. military. Uh, obviously, it's Reddit, so. <laughs> but uh, today I learned that the Army used Xbox, three, Xbox 360 controllers to fly UAV spy planes. That is awesome. I mean, it makes sense. It does. But what was the, the thing? What is your favorite book of the Bible? Uh, well, no, what was the... Oh, the off-topic part is what it was on. Um, my favorite book of the Bible? Ooh. I really do like Daniel. Why? Only that one chapter. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, That's I don't awesome. know. I... I genuinely enjoy Revelation because it's confusing. Fair. Yeah, I still haven't read the Revelation. I, yeah. I should probably do that. It is. But yeah, I, Daniel Daniel for a lot of reasons, but, but chiefly it's the, the the three contributions to the feast. Yeah. Because just Belshazzar, you know, started off with just unrestrained sensuality. God being like, here is my hand on the wall. And then Daniel's just like, I will announce doom. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we talked like that more in real yeah. life. That'd be great. Uh, I am here to pronounce the doom. What? Hand on the wall? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, there's only one left. <laughs> <laughs> Archie runs in. <laughs> Archie's not here tonight. He's, uh, he's, he's keeping not. my family's dog company. Yes. Uh, the Sky King 5, incredible username, by the way. Uh, just wanted to say I've been loving your content. Keep up the great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Sheev said for $2, a dossie. A dossie, okay. Uh, and then... I love Kyrari. that Dr. Sheev is, is literally just Palpatine in a doctor's cap. Uh, like, it's great. It's beautiful. It's so good. Uh, Kiaroru Gio, I'm sorry if I horribly mispronounced that, but I tried. Uh, oh, Kia Ro Yu Gil. I think Probably. so. Where to send Mothman art so you actually see it? Physical or digital? Physical, I'm going to open a P.O. box this week. I've been meaning to do yeah. it. Digital, uh, the lore lodge at gmail.com. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to go here. Uh, Retina Deer. Or you could just send it to me on Instagram. Yeah. That's right. also an option. I will show it to him. But Yeah. Retina Deer for $2 said, talk about feet and the link to holiness, big feet. Is Bigfoot the second coming? Uh, Question mark? Answer? Daily Double. I'm just still stuck on the first three words. <laughs> Talk about feet. <laughs> oh, well, we did. We've officially begun. Talk about feet. <laughs> you guys scare me. You guys actually scare me. Uh, are y'all hyped for 200k jack garcia asked for we two. are yeah um it's where are we how far are i we think going? we're at like 187 studio which is just insane we you are that's... logged into your own channel yep your tiny pathetic little channel the one i do nothing i know <laughs> that somehow has 500 hours of watch time <laughs> don't know um, yeah about 187 yep just about so yeah closing in what is that, 10 away, I guess? Which it's exciting. It's very exciting, actually. Yeah, we uh, considering we hit 200, or 100 in December. <laughs> yeah, it's honestly been insane. Yeah. We're hungry for that gold play button, though. Oh, boy. Hungry. I know if we just keep making content, we'll eventually get there. Yeah. But, oh. Slowly but surely. 
I'm not even thinking about it because I, I mean, even even at a thousand subscribers a day, that's still three years. Yep. Marathon, not a sprint, <laughs> that's for sure. We'll get there. Eventually. Scout Hussy and a Dussy. Who's Scout Hussy? I don't know. Did I miss something? If you read Daniel and Revel wait, go down. If you read Daniel and Revelation at the same time, Revelation makes more sense. Yes. <laughs> That's actually true. Um, basically, any of the apocalyptic Old Testament books are really helpful. Many, many tekel upfarsen. Plaz, what does that mean? It's what uh, the writing on the wall says. Ah. And it means uh, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Uh your nation will be divided and given unto the Medes and Persians. And then uh, I think something like your house is laid waste or something like that. Um, basically, you're going to die. Get all that from four words? Yeah. And two of them are the same. That is shocking. My my guess is that they're it's ancient Hebrew. Mm-hmm. That also might be like, like abbreviations yeah fair there's also the possibility that it was written in that daniel understood what it said because of god ireland cook another incredible username for ten dollars first super chat ever wanted to help with the goal thank you you are incredible thank you sir or ma'am or whomever you may or may not be uh bigfoot was 24 inches but it smelled like a foot oh yeah oh <laughs> I'm, I was a little shocked you read that one. That's why I read it. It's because I didn't understand. <laughs> um, it happens. Uh, uh, you're doing well since some people on YouTube, uh, since you use Star 3 videos and they have yeah. lower subs. Who's the guy next to Adosi? It's also Aiden. We're both Aiden. I'm the other Aiden. I'm Squidward. He's Squidward. We're, We're all Squidward. Squidward. <laughs> oh. I like that they just call you Thorn Bussy. <laughs> you don't get a name. <laughs> nope. Um, Thank you, Dr. Sheep, for yeah. making the clarification. But, all right. It is 834. It is. We've got to go. But thank you all for hanging out. We will have another video for you on Friday, assuming it's not <laughs> Saturday. Assuming uh, we get through it, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that, that's about it. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you guys next week.